So good evening, uh, everybody, ladies and gentlemen. I have the privilege of uh, chairing this uh, plenary session on the it's an historical survey and emerging challenges of manufacturing automation, modeling, and control, a global perspective. Our speaker is Carlos Eduardo Pereira, and the work uh, has been co-authored by Shimon Noff and uh, Gerardo Morel. Professor Carlos Pereira works at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul in Porto Alegre, southern Brazil, where he chairs the Control Automatic and Robotics Group, a research team that includes seven faculty members and more than 40 graduate students. He supervised more than 100 PhD and master thesis, and several of his students are holding important positions in academia and industry. The research activity is, is the Professor Pereira research activity focuses on methodologies and tool support for the development of distributed real-time embedded systems. Uh, within IFAC, he has uh, had uh, several uh, leadership uh, positions, and he is currently an IFAC Council member. Please, Professor Pereira. Thank you, Sergio, for the nice introduction. Thank you all for being here. Just to be sure, this is a talk about the manufacturing. The control is another <laughs> part. And yeah, it's a great honor and pleasure to deliver this semi-plenary presentation together with two persons that I consider not only very distinguished researchers, but also friends. Shimonov from Purdue University was actually the one that was supposed to give this presentation but could not come. And uh, we have also Gerard Morel that's, despite of being a retired professor, is still very active and is here and can also take questions later on. And, and myself. As you can see from the title, we're going to talk about some historical perspective, but also some emerging challenges. That means we look back, and I also look a little bit to the future. And in order to start with some history, we should took, look a little bit into the etymology of the words. You know, being from Brazil, we speak Portuguese. Latin is a close language. And it's interesting to see that manufacture comes from two Latin words, manus from hand, and factus that make. And the first no use of the term manufacture was around 1567, according to the Merriam Webster dictionary. And prior to the Industrial Revolution, manufacture simply meant to product or uh, to make products or goods by hand. But if you look, we are talking about manufacture automation. Manufacture automation allows already nowadays that uh, these manufacture systems, the manufacturing plants operate almost fully automated, like this one. And the first question would be, could you still consider this to be manufactured? Because there's no hands anymore there. And, but if you look now, the dictionary already mentioned that this can just be done by machinery. That means it's also one case that the technology changed the original meaning was only to think in terms of the man. We are focused on manufacturing automation during this presentation. And definitely manufacturing automation has been strongly influenced by advances in ICT, embedded harder uh, software and automatic control. And in order to cope with the increasingly complex products and with a higher degree of customization and to deal with frequent changing market demands with environmental uh, regulations, advanced manufacturing techniques and their corresponding automation have been developed. And IFAC has been very active uh, in this, or very involved in this history over the last six years. We have a CC, CC5, Director of Manufacturing Logistics System, but also have the CCs 4, 3, and several other TCs that are engaged in this. If you can compare where we start doing manufacturing from the main kind, we can start okay from Stone Age, eventually was the first time we start doing some manufacturing, and definitely there is a tremendous uh, advance from the very beginning to the what's called now the cyber uh, physical autonomous system. And we have things that the complexity has also dramatically increased. We have to, to deal with control scope extensions. We deal not only with control, we have to be able to take failures. We have to deal with life cycle planning and uh, the cyber automation. 
And the overall historical trend is these manufacturing systems, the manufacturing machines, automat their automatic control and automation system were developing and are evolving like humans. And they are de being designed to better assist humans. They have evolved by becoming useful and affordable. That's a good thing. And an interesting thing also is the methods were developed to design and automate them. And also the methods have been automated. The key issue, because we're dealing also with some safe critical applications, to have to pay attention to all details all the time. And if you look forward, you look to the future, we can predict that future machines will be completely self-sufficient. We have going to have several robots and autonomous machines working in perfect unison and increasing the effectiveness of manufacturing processes. And I, the, 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 the great challenge that we have is how to get there safely, securely, and sustainably. I will start the presentation also. I was considering several times where I put this. I think it's here is a nice point to start, although it's kind of innovation. Uh, let's hope when the picture comes, that it's going to appear correctly. I was mentioned about the synchronization issue there. But the, the idea here is, is to see if, um, how the future production will be, and I think it makes it easier then to understand the, what we're going to discuss. For example, the configuration and personalization of cars will take on a new dimension in the future. It will be possible to freely select the size and shape of the car's information display. No two cars will ever be alike again. They will be individually tailored to customers' needs. The automaker generates design data from the 3D model and sends the data to various suppliers. There, the data undergoes a final virtual design and testing process. This is how the personalized information display we saw earlier will be created. Planners then determine which process modules are required for manufacturing. There will hardly be any more need for special machinery. Planning and modification cycles will be significantly shorter. The implant flows of supplier parts and finished parts will also be optimized. The production process starts from virtual representations. The internet-based system then puts together the ideal manufacturing line on the factory floor. An associate puts the individual modules in the correct position, or they take up their position in the line automatically. Autonomous rollers ensure efficient plant logistics. At the Confidence Center, at a completely different site, experts are already beginning to train identical process modules for their tasks and make the manufacturing parameters available. The modules are ready for manufacturing immediately and produce zero errors right from the very first part. Rejects are a thing of the past. The display knows which process modules it needs and maneuvers automatically to them, depending on availability and requirements. A wide variety of products now pass along a single line. The finished product is packaged and sent to the automaker. Sensors on the packaging detect the condition and position of products and transmit this information to the Bosch IoT Cloud. This makes it possible to continuously monitor product quality along the supply chain in real time. Manufacturing will offer us far more than we ever thought possible. More versatility, optimum resource efficiency, and products that are more personalized than ever before. Okay, this is a video available on the internet from the company Bosch. And I think it's interesting because then we know where we are heading to, and the question is what we have to do to, together and what have been done over the last years. I think also the site put here because when you talk about manufacturers, it's important to see that manufacturers not only more about production thing. We have to talk thing about the logistics, intra, external logistics. We have to think about maintenance. We have to think about reusability, recycle, and you have to think about, a lot about management of different activities. And, and this is what we are going to talk and see how this evolved. 
Having three co-authors in the same plenary has some advantages, but also some interesting discussions that have. We, we have, I must say this last month had been very interesting in terms I've learned a lot in discussing, but at the end I had to, I was on charge of putting together the presentation to present you what our, our view from the three authors in terms of the history of manufacturing automation. And after uh, thinking a lot about this, I decided to, to see that basically what was happening, that we had different perspective uh, about to tell this story about the history of manufacturing automation. And that's actually uh, inherent on human beings. If you look at a historical book, uh, you always have a kind of a bias of who the wrote the book. And when comparing those three different stories, I think they were kind of complementary, and to some extent, it was nice to have. And then I decided to have this very hard decision to, to try to combine both three uh, stories, and I hope I will succeed, and, and hope by doing that, I'm not making any of the co-authors mad at me, because if I would select my story, they would be very mad at me, then I try to have this combination. And I will start with the first view is that uh, about the increasing role of embedded knowledge based automatic control and cyber supported collaboration in terms of manufacturing automation. And that starts by some classification about the generations of manufacturing automation. And here is, you're going to see in different story, we're going to have also kind of similar divisions in this one that's, by the way, in this book, uh, the Handbook of Automation that was published 2009 and was uh, leadership from Shimonov. They talk about four different uh, generations. The first one is called the BAC. This is before automatic control. That's then definitely very good for IFAC conference. That's mean use automatic control as the key point. And the second one is the manual automatic control before computers, where we talk then only about analog controllers. The third one, the CAC, the computer automatic control. And the fourth, fourth one, this emerging future, this autonomic cyber control. Another picture that eventually is easier than to understand is looking more in terms of the machine tools that we have. Consider that the first innovation that goes then to this uh, autom uh, automatic control, but before computers, was really when we start developing hardware, basically. It was where the mechanical guys, the mechanical engineer guys were uh, the kings in terms of the automatic control. We have developed tools, we have developed machine tools, and we're able to do, also using analog controls and mechanical controls, some interesting. Uh, we're going to show like, some pictures later on. The second innovation phase would be when we start putting software, then we have the numeric control machine tools, we have uh, be able to do motion control, we can even do adaptive control, and with the third innovation, we start being, bringing the information and the knowledge in, into place, we start using artificial intelligence, and then we start talking about intelligent uh, numeric control machine tools and applications. Again, as a historical talk, I have to bring some pictures, the pictures are also from the uh, handbook of automation. I basically concentrate on some few pictures to tell about the past, but it's interesting to see, this is two examples of uh, uh, some automatic control and tools that were there even before we have computers. The first one is the John Wilkinson boring machine that was able to machine a high accuracy cylinder that was used to build Watts steam engines. And because of these machines, the performance of the, the steam engines become, were dramatic, uh, drastically enhanced, and that they become possible to do what you know later as industrial revolution. Uh, here we have this modestly, if I pronounce it correct, the screw cutting plate with mechanized tool carriage that was also a great invention to uh, be able to machine high accuracy uh, screw threads. The right, we have some kind of the first representatives of these automatic control uh, with some computers in the first phase. This was considered to be a flexible manufacturing system here. We have here on top a tool to red with 12 uh, cutting tools using turning centers. And here we have what is considered to be this flexible manufacturing system with some machine centers, some load and unload stations uh, with conveyors. When also, when talking about the history of auto, uh, manufacturing automation, it's important to mention the uh, Ford automotive company. In 98, Henry Ford and Charles Sorenson, uh, they basically defined the whole manufacturing model by the, the Model T automobile. They developed the assembly line, 
uh, assign a specific test to each person in the line to get the cars built fast and efficiently. And it's also interesting by looking at the historical books, they say that Henry Ford paid his employees enough to allow them to buy the cars, because also at the beginning, you know, without the market, we cannot uh, uh, progress. And this picture is from the Ford River Rouge Complex in uh, Michigan, Deborah, Michigan, USA. That they started construction in 1917, and it was completed in 1928, and became the largest integrated factory in the world. What's interesting here, they have uh, in the 30s over 100,000 workers. The uh, complex has inside on electricity plant, an interior railroad track, and also integrated steel mill. That means this was really some kind of prime example of vertical integration. But everything at the beginning without computers. But the challenge that we have in the past were that we, uh, without having computers, by having very primitive sensors, uh, people and machines could, were not able to collaborate effectively. And the reason why we have less feedback, we have because of the primitive sensors, again, it was before computers. We have also inflexible manufacturing because it was difficult to set the control rules. And we have also issues with the factory networking that were slow to implement communication integration. We also have less precision in the past because of the primitive sensors, infrequent measurements, slower computers, limited program size and memory. And that leads to larger approximation in calculations that also bring to quality and cost to issues. That as a result, we have uh, relatively low productivity and quality and also adverse world conditions. We are jump now a little bit in history already at the point that we have computers and the computers have been used in several different parts of some manufacturing plants or in this case a steel industry that's also a very important supply for the manufacturing. And as you can see here, we have also several computers but they are still working more as what was called at that time islands of automation. They are not very connected, but regardless, this, they have a lot of different uh, subsystems being automated. And this was uh, bringing then complexity in place. And in order to, 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 help, to deal with this complexity, it was necessary to come with some integration control frameworks. And here we have then in the 92, the Purdue Enterprise Reference Architecture for Industrial Plan Control that was proposed. And this is being used more or less up to date. It's basically the idea of having several different layers, and each layer has deals with a different characteristics. I think here we have a summary that's easiest to understand. They have in the lower levels, think dealing with the, the sensors, actuators, and the controllers, also combined in batch control, continuous control, discrete control. At the upper mid levels, we have the manufacturing operations and control, and higher levels, we have the business planning and logistics. And this was, again, was mentioned, it was being used almost uh, up to now, but this has some problems that we're going to discuss later on. Here is the idea to see more about the knowledge based control, that means in moving to level and intelligence in manufacturing automation, modeling control. Uh, we start using knowledge-based modeling and control methods. Uh, for instance, we have uh, this good example is for metal stamping and uh, uh, workings where they have some publication uh, describing different stamping phase or different uh, uh, knowledge-based system that were developed for the different phase in the stamping, specifically the stamped part design, the stamping process planning, die structure planning, manufacturing with the focus on progressive die designs and less it's a strip layout planning. It's uh, interesting work also because they doing this, they can achieve traceability to record products and process history. And with the acquired sort of machine learning knowledge that was used to automatic control and to enable flexibility to, to respond or anticipate design and market change. They also use this in terms of enhancing the sustainability of the whole uh, process. They have better accuracy for safety, quality, better quality of life globally because we're using globally, but are more costly and more control advanced expertise were required. Then we have these advances of uh, the wireless sensor and RFID uh, connected network developed and they become pervasive into the plants and they have become cheaper, more accurate, 
They have uh, several different protocols developed for doing intelligent control. And in addition to the communication protocols, they start defining these what's so called the task administration protocols in order to be able to better handle it and provide different services when assessing this. The, this was also not also only true internally, but also for the external uh, logistics and transportation infrastructure, where we start using also the, these uh, uh, RFID tags and wireless communication, allowing to do several different uh, 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 functions, like to have this hijacking, protect against hijacking, tempering, and using up fault tolerant planning and control. This uh, evolution and communication was, from one hand, very positive, but on the other hand, brings a lot of uh, complications in terms that we have then several different heterogeneous networks, and the interconnection of this, that these networks become very difficult. And it was a problem because for automation domain, you have to ensure uh, some characteristics like timeliness and security and safety. And within that context, there was the concept of the virtual automation networks that are open communication integration architectures uh, that copes with the specific automation task demands like security and safety requirements and concurrently considers the change base for previous homogeneous automation island to heterogeneous network. This technology, communication technology evolution, makes then the, the whole pyramid form uh, unfeasible because they've, there are some new opportunities. On one hand, we could respond more flexible to new clients' demands and market chains. We had the ability to quickly and effectively reach partners. But on the other hand, we, uh, using this uh, rigid pyramid form, we need to go across the layers, and that caused some delays and some overhead. And direct communication among the layers, avoiding unnecessary communication via intermediate layers communication would be necessary. But more than looking only inside the, the manufacturing plants, then we start seeing that we are able to communicate among organizations. We are made able to, uh, inter to try to interoperate organization. But in order to do that, they must be willing to cooperate and collaborate. Therefore, a new theory about distributed parties, agents, you know, how they can collaborate was necessary. And uh, questions like how to cooperate op optimally, how to overcome collaboration errors, was, and then here was some papers proposing the concept of collaborative network organizations that are organizations that can, that are largely autonomous, geographically distributed, and heterogeneous in terms of the operating environment and can collaborate. When having this intelligence in the organizations was, uh, we could also perceive an uh, increasing use of predictive control. And why? Not only because predictive control, like model-based predictive control, could be used uh, very successfully for several different processes that are belonging to this manufacturing environment, like, for instance, ledger processing and helping to save energy, but also to be able to predict things in order to be able then to be more reactive. Then uh, we have these manufacturing automation engineers and researchers using MPC theory, for instance, for doing this error and conflict diagnostics and prognosis where they're using control logic over co uh, coordinated networks to reduce and eliminate process errors. The whole thing leads then to this theory that was considered to be this collaborative control theory that is used in this cyber-supported collaborative factor of the future. I think it's easier to understand when think in terms of the picture. We have then the supply chain interacting, try to uh, obtain an optimum. And, and these uh, effective collaboration models can overcome sustainability and resilience in challenges. We can use these control protocols to resolve conflicts, negotiate agreements, prevent errors. We can use fault tolerance. And that leads to what was considered to be this uh, collaborative intelligence. To have some examples of uh, how this can be used, you have here four industry application of using these, uh, these uh, protocols. For instance, comparing these different task administration protocols uh, with each other that's here. And here we compare to, is compared to one protocols to these more standard protocols like uh, 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 contract network protocols. 
And here we have also another thing that's the benefits of demand and capacity sharing protocols in that we uh, can evaluate if, for instance, competitors can share resources and be becoming more competitive. Here we have some uh, examples showing, for instance, the reduction of the pollutants per product or the uh, manufacturing idle capacity being decreased in terms of achieving a, a better a global approach. This was then uh, systematized by using these concepts of e-work functions, e-manufacturing, and e-production control. This is basically to say that we e-work function that we want to use is like e-operation, human-computer interaction, human-robot interaction, uh, can be used using some control tools like agents, protocols, workflow, and then enables then this whole e-manufacturing. Finally, we can have this all uh, e-dimension then summarized, and the e-dimensions are important to allow people then to develop those cyber-supported uh, uh, collaborative systems. And we're still several challenges in this collaborative e-manufacturing. But for sake of time, let's move to the second story about his history of automation. That's the one that's considered looking into this another a similar perspective, but is more now driven by the industry. It is industry 4.0, uh, I would say, aspect. We also have here four different generations, what I call this uh, industry 1, 2, and 3, and 4, 0. First one based on steam machine, the first industrial revolution, the second industrial revolution based on electrical machines, third in the use of IT, programming logic controllers, and finally with the industrial revolution in terms of cyber physical systems. This story goes about the whole digital transformation of the industry where we can use then uh, from supply chain to products to customer experience to have digitalization in different industrial function in this bringing several opportunities for value creation. Also here, the industrial communication, the communication has a place. It has, in this case, several different industrial communication protocols, very specific for real-time behavior, ensuring fault tolerance and so on. And those protocols enable then us to get rid of this low-level PLC control, ladder control programming language, and go to higher levels of abstraction. We can use, for instance, here, use the kind of uh, object-oriented language, real-time object-oriented language, where you can then have some logical objects that mimic the real, uh, the real world device. This has then been around 2005, being industrial, uh, standardized by industry. For instance, this Profinet protocol, where the use of those industrial components were there to allow some modularization of the application, to allow easy the communication between devices and to do with some graphic configuration tools. And with advances of embedded microcontrollers and also, uh, again, the embedded software, we can have now a concept like smart modules, where they replace this electrical connection by having self a controller and communication the device, and then we build a cyber physical system that can be used then for, to build these uh, cyber physical applications. Uh, by the way, this has been a talk, for instance, to show that IFAC was also early talking about this in a plenary lecture at the IFAC World Congress in Seoul by Professor Zulke that's here, and use this as a building blocks for allowing them to construct more uh, production lines and modularize uh, uh, factors that was this concept of smart factory. It's interesting to see that this, this uh, with the whole infrastructure by having products being able to communicate people and interacting among the device, we can then offer different services, but we can also connect to the cloud and do more uh, geographically wide application, also connect to the internet. And one side effect that is very interesting that basically the whole pyramid structure goes away, and then we have more and more the possibility to have networking contact. And uh, this has then evolved to the concept of digital twins, that is a concept that's been now widely adopted by several companies, uh, and for instance, like the company Siemens here, and the idea here, or Embraer, this resilient aircraft company, where we have projects in this area with them, is the idea is to merging these real with virtual worlds with the concept of digital twins. Digital twins allows this combination then of physical production facility, digital models, 
and can be used along the life cycle, both in terms of the product design as well as the production design. And here is also a point where it's sometimes it's difficult to understand how is a digital twin looks like, how we can interact with a digital twin. And then I have another video here to show. This is from General Electric. I attended last week a conference, in, an innovation conference in Brazil, where we have this uh, VP of uh, Software Research at GE showing this project in terms of interactive uh, steam turbine. And I think it's very interesting to see because this is one of a kind of a different steam turbine that they have and shows how you can do some maintenance and assessment of how it can improve the production by interacting directly with the digital twin. Operator, a change in my mission is causing damage to my HP turbine rotor. Okay, twin, help me understand the problem. What's your operating profile? In past six months, my number of cold starts is four, my number of warm starts is eight, my number of hot starts is 39, the number of start-stop cycles has increased by 27.5%. Twin, tell me about your rotor damage. My damage rate has increased by 4.0 times over last six months. If this continues, I would lose 69.9% of my useful life. Twin, give me options for mitigating that rotor damage. Based on weather forecasts, historical data, fuel cost, electricity pricing and my present condition, I have two options for you to optimize operations. Option one is to manually slow down my startup ramp rate so that you can reduce the wear on my rotor. Option two is to download the Opflex app and apply stress controls to minimize wear and reduce fuel consumption too. Twin, give me the factors you use to calculate option two. I used my past 15 years of historical data, fleet learning from 125 other D11 steam turbines like me, and 58,965 simulation runs to get this recommendation. I'm 95% confident of my assumptions. Twin, I need a financial perspective. Tell me about the numbers. The numbers look good. We can reduce stress by 25%, which brings the damage rate back to normal range. Startup fuel cost will go down by 40% and startup time will be cut by 50%. You will also avoid $12 million by preventing an unplanned outage. Twin, okay, I select option two. Let's do it. Okay, let's show them this interaction with the twin that what's behind, of course, is all the techniques that we, we have. And, and then we can move then to the third part of is the history of manufacturing automation from the perspective of the CC5 milestone report. Our uh, coordinating committee five, as all the other the coordinate committees from IFAC, every triennium produce some reports showing the, what's been achieved over the triennium. And it's very interesting if we can analyze and look back and, and see this, and we're going to see that most of the discussions that we have seen so far have been reported there. And the first thing is the discussion about what you have to control. We have and we talk here since a long time in the, the, our CCs and TCs and this concept of enterprise system automation. That means it's not only going from the low level to manufacturing plan, but also the whole enterprise. And, and here is have that is uh, important to have a holistic view. And basically the whole two threads that we have here is the integration in manufacturing, intelligence in manufacturing. And, it's important to recognize that if you have larger scale manufacturing and logistics systems, they exhibit characteristics that are beyond the traditional ones of manufacturing automation and require an interdisciplinary system in architecture. The basically what is, we can see the discussion when it is see this, we know technology is almost everything there, but now we have to see how you can architect this in terms of system. The computer integrated manufacturing that I was showing before, they, they have started, they're not new, they started already in the 80s. And the integration, like we talked before about this model, layer model, where you have these decision maze in different levels, you have some uh, corresponding information system there, is uh, around that. What is interesting to see, you have basically two different dimensional integration that are required. One is in the direction of the product flow and this is uh, a diachronic 
uh, synchronization needed. This is through time. This is the integration of product life cycle over the manufacturing chain. And the other is syn synchronic, that is up at the different levels. And, and again, if you look at these enterprise integration frameworks, we actually Purdue was even not the first one. We have the, even before the enterprise modeling framework proposed in 97. We also have several different work done, particularly in France and in Europe. We have, for instance, the Simosa model and, and other research that have done. And this ended by the ISO 1943-9. And also, we have work done on process modeling techniques to complete the dynamics of the system with the business information and the component uh, data level. We have another aspect that by this digitalization of the industry, we are generating a lot of data and software is becoming more and more predominant. Also interested to see here, this is from contribution from some other researchers in our CC and this led by Johnson, that was a researcher at General Electric in USA, doing a research there, that shows, for instance, that we, we have, by the software complexity increasing, the whole availability of the systems is, is being dangerous. And that should be taken account that not only this bring advantage, but also some danger. We have, and we go for this area of uh, distributed control engineering, as indicated before, the automation pyramid is not able to cope with complexities of the manufacturing environment, and then new control paradigms are needed for transforming the computer integrated manufacturing to cooperative control for distributed manufacturing. And this distribution, in this case, means to have cooperative control architecture and to ensure a better responsiveness to open end changes that are required. And here we can identify two different threads. One is to embed more computation techniques in the automation, and the other is to use bio-inspired architectures. One area where we've been very active in our committees is the maintenance systems, distributed prognostic and engineering. We have a very active uh, working group, AMS, there at a meeting this afternoon. And uh, here we could perceive that knowledge-based ma management techniques for data-driven or model-based prognosis have been investigated. One aspect is really based on data. As we've seen before, we have plenty of sensors now in machines and, and in uh, logistics uh, uh, components and so on. And by giving the information for data, we can be able to identify to do some diagnostics. And moreover, if you have this big data analysis and can do some predictive analytics there, we can get some information. And by doing that, we can predict then uh, possibilities. Uh, this here also summarizes some other researcher that is very active in our CC, Professor Jay Lee from University of Cincinnati that shows nicely these as equipment and process are, uh, 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 have some degradation processes. By having the embedded force of information can use in models or using spare knowledge, we can be able to assess or forecast or prognose what's going wrong and you can have then, for instance, aiming a near zero downtime or even autonomous service request for spare part that's done by the device directed to the business. We also have been involved in different projects like that where you have IMS systems combined with uh, supply chain and also with production system aiming to ensure an optimization of the whole uh, production chain and different phase. Another area that's been uh, quite researched in the committees are these product-driven discrete control of manufacturing systems. That is a kind of evolution for the discrete event control that usually deals with, if I know the dynamics and know the goal, I can derive unknown control rules that ensure that an automation system will uh, behave accordingly. And this usually is based on the fact that we do process sensing. With the advances of this RFID concept, we are able then to get information direct from the product that means we can not only have process sensing and have indirectly measurements about the product, we can have information directly from the product. And this is interesting, it allows the development of the so-called intelligent products, where we have the products now becoming the key uh, the controllers or, or managing the whole production. And that shows very interesting for doing, for instance, uh, these uh, uh, production of uh, 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 highly customized products. We here, this 
can have this productive and interoperability in engineering. There's also more than by Professor Morel here, where the idea is by having this product or even design, we kind of unflip this uh, whole uh, pyramid and we have an easier than direct uh, integration among these manufacturing plant levels with the product flow, allowing them a better uh, controllability of this. Uh, we also have here the concept of a multi-scale enterprise modeling framework that allows you then to integrate these different views. In terms of the uh, biological influence for these intelligent control engineering manufacturing systems, uh, uh, key work here was from Albus in 91. That was basically the idea starting having some reasoning about the state of the system being able then to, to generate a solution. We have here one framework, uh, the ISM framework as a framework for the field security assurance and associated technical metrics, where we have then some architecture provide where uh, the, there are, each node has then the ability to reason, and this have reason also to move to the concept of uh, multi-agent systems, and multi-agent systems being systems where you have interacting software agent exhibiting properties of autonomy, sociability, uh, reactivity, and proactiveness. Here we also have some results on one of these uh, our milestones report here showing how this network of agents can then express some complex emergent behavior and with that we can deal with uncertain and changing parameters and be able to uh, better control the overall system. Here we have some work also done showing that the large number of companies and also some uh, projects that have been developed for dealing with this application of uh, industrial agents. Another concept that has been investigated over the years is the holonic controls concept, the holonic manufacturing systems, and the idea here is to use the concept of holon, that is this has the duality of being a whole or a part, that means it's uh, from the hybrid nature of organization units in biological and social system which behave partly as self-contained wholes or wholly as dependent parts. And the Holonic has been interesting because they can help in terms of providing an architecture to have this direct connection between the uh, real devices and the logical device. We have here uh, one of the architectures that's been proposed is PROSA, this product resource order staff architecture is one of the most successful being used and, and several different applications were developed using this concept of having resources and it was very nice because it helps in, in having a separation of concerns to this. Here we have some applications, also a project here in France for a train uh, automation where you can have the doors, the cars are mapped to Holland and this nicely have this feature of uh, being increasing the system without uh, increasing much the complexity. Uh, some other aspects that are important to take into account are the social technical aspects the fact that humans have limitations for leading to recurrent errors uh, at work require artificial control is clear, but humans also have the unique capabilities to replace artificial control and unanticipated uh, unanticipate situation. This is also a, problem, a project here where Professor Morel was involved, is the maintenance of uh, aircraft, it's a project with Airbus, and we have this latch and lock problem here that we have two different subsystems that have been developed for their safety critical, but the junction exactly of this latch and lock uh, was not possible to be perceived by a person, then they have to use different strategies to integrate this without would not be possible. That means it's very important to have interdisciplinary system engineering, and here we have, for instance, the um, like example using this uh, digitalized interdisciplinary system engineering to price of some projects by here the so systems also here in France where the goal here is to have a cross discipline for modeling and to do this integration of the different tools and different labs. And uh, here's important to mention the concept of functional mock-up interfaces that aims to ensure a standardized openness interface to the use computer simulations and to develop complex cyber physical system. And this, in summary, is also an outlook again, this future of automatic, uh, manufacturing with automatic control, as emerging perceived as smarter cyber physical machines, factories and supply networks with parallel teams will be able to interact better. 
if they can communicate, interoperate, and collaborate autonomously with self-learning and repair, enabling production effectiveness and harmony. And the manufacturing automatic control will be intuitive, like we presented by this video division of this interactive, uh, the digital twin, or even the interacting in the beginning. Uh, they will rely on multi-agent systems, holonic manufacturing system, machine learning, real-time integration. That means a lot of different concepts. And finally, I would like to invite you to be part of this history, help us to make manufacturing automation history, join our IFAC CCs and TCs work in this area. And thanks for your attention, and it's a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much, Carlos. Before I forgot to tell you who I am, my name is Sergio Bittanti from the Engineering School of Milan. So again, I thank you. I thank um, the speaker for this uh, terrific work he did to prepare uh, all the slides and uh, work about and so on. And um, I wish you the best for this conference and for your life. Again, join me to in a big round of applause for Carlos. Thank you.